who already have a very good finance background, they just are lacking in the coding domain. So I help them in automating the strategies and all. All right. So let me just uh, walk you through what are the things we will be covering in the coming four months. So we will be starting with the basic concept, uh, the basic fundamental, like what are variables, string, conditional data structure, loops, function, and all. Once you have covered the basics topic, we will move to data analysis. So the things that you do in Excel, the same thing can also be done in Python. Okay. So for that, we have to learn libraries like pandas, numpy, all those library. Once we are done with that, we will move to time series data. Now, the thing that makes finance different or stock market different from other domain is time series. Okay. All the data are time based. Okay. We have a timestamp and we have a data on that timestamp. So we will try to understand the time series data. Then uh, once we are done with that, we will move to some advanced topic, then data scraping. Like, let's say you want some data from some website. So how do you, how can you get the data from that website by web scraping? Those things we will be discussing. Uh, then database, how to store the data in a database. Let's say you're getting stock data. So how you can store it in a database, SQL database that we will be covering. Once we have completed all the basic stuff, then we will move to financial trading. So first we will be covering fundamental analysis. So how to get fundamental ratios like P ratios or P ratio, then a market value ratio, different types of ratios are there. So how to calculate those things. Then we will move to technical analysis. In technical analysis, there are different indicators like SMA, EMA, MACD, RSI, Bollinger Band, all those things. So you might have seen all those things on TradingView, right? So we, I'll show you how to code it uh, by using Python. Then some price exchange strategies like how to figure out a doji candle, how to figure out a hammer candle, all those things. Then performance metrics. Now, once you have a strategy, now, how will you say if the strategy is good or bad? So we have to understand performance metrics like CAGR, maximum drawdown, calmer ratio, volatility, all those things. Once we have done all the basic stuff, then we will move to actual trading. Now for trading purpose, there are two brokers that I will be teaching during the live session. One is interactive broker. So how does interactive broker looks like? This is how the interactive broker interface looks like. It's a global broker. So if you're situated in Dubai, Singapore or Europe, so you should be able to get the account of this broker. So this is the main broker that I will be teaching on. So I want everyone to have an account on this broker. Okay. So how to open an account? I have made a video. Okay. Or two, there are two videos available in your dashboard. You can just go through the video to understand how to open your account in interactive broker. Now, once you have the broker, then we will understand about contract. Now, the difference between a international broker and a local broker is that when you move to international broker, there are multiple stocks of multiple exchange. Now, let's say you're talking about Infosys stock. Now, Infosys stock is not only situated in India, it is also situated in NASDAQ. Okay, so you need to specify which exchange or which instrument you want to trade. So how to make a contract, all those things we will be discussing, then how to get historical data, whether you want one minute data, five minute data, 15 minute daily data, how you can get that data, then real time market WebSocket data. Now there are two types of data. One is bar data and one is tick level data. Now, when I say bar data, it means it has four things. It has open data, high data, low data, close data. When I talk about tick data, it's a single data. Uh, for a single timestamp, we have a single data. So how you can get real time, uh, one second level data, those things we will be discussing. Then orders, how do you place different types of order, whether it be market order, limit order, bracket order, cover order, all the different types of order we will be discussing. Once all the basic uh, trading concepts are clear, then we will move to strategy building. So I will be discussing multiple strategies like MACD strategy, Bollinger Band strategy, how to create an indicator, how to take a buy position, how to take a sell position, all those things we will be discussing. Then I will be covering backtesting part. There is a library in Python called as backtesting.py, that library we will be using, and uh, we will be backtesting the strategy. So if you go to strategy and backtesting, I have provided you with some sample uh, backtesting code. So this is how the strategy output look like, and this is how the output is going to look like, okay? This is the graph. If you want, you can zoom in. So I'll just show you how to zoom in. I just have to click here. Just zoom in. These are all the candles. If you want to go back, click here. The two trades were taken in this uh, time frame. So all the things are available in the dashboard. Everything I will be discussing. Now, once the basic indicator based strategies are done, then we will move to advanced topic. Now, in advanced topic, we have two to three topic. Like one is how to deploy your strategy on a cloud. Now you are you have created your own strategy. Now you don't want to run your strategy in your system. Instead of that, we will deploy it on AWS server. 
So that also I will be covering. Then we will move to option strategy. Now option strategy is considered as advanced strategy. Okay. So if you already have the option knowledge, only then I will suggest you to attend those session in that I'll teach you how you can implement option strategies like straddle, strangle, any multi-leg strategy uh, that exists out there. You will be able to implement it after you have uh, attended my uh, option strategy session. After option strategy, we will move to machine learning. So in machine learning, I'll teach you about sentiment analysis. Like if there is a news or if there is some article. So how do you analyze that article? We will use a Veda sentiment analysis tool and all. So these are all the things that we will be covering in the coming four months. Okay. So anyone has any doubt in anything? Anyone want to ask anything in the curriculum? Uh... I'm Sagar. Uh, so yeah. I have one question. So basically I'm from software engineering background. So I'm not sure about the scammer ratio. Or, I mean, I have a decent idea, sharp ratio and all. So will that hmm. be explained or should I uh, raise myself all those things? Uh, I'll provide you the resources from okay. where you can just read about the concept or you can read it from the dashboard too. It's not that difficult. In case if you still don't understand, just message me. I'll help you out. Sure. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, that's all. Also see any strategy that I discuss during the session is applicable for all the market. Okay. Whether you trade in Forex market, whether you trade in crypto market, because at the end of the day, they are just a candle. Okay. Any strategy that you design uh, in a single market, you will be able to move that in any other market that you want. It's just that you just have to backtest it once in that strategy. Also, I will also be discussing about parameter optimization. Like, let's say you have a strategy in which you are using some indicator. Now you want to know that what should be that uh, indicator's uh, length, you know, like SMA length, what should be the optimized length, which will give me the maximum profit or what should be the optimized stop loss, which will give me the maximum profit. So anything you want to optimize, you know, those things also I will be covering during the backtesting session. Yes, yeah, that you want to ask something. Uh, can you explain about what is this interactive broker uh, you just yeah. mentioned? Yeah, yeah. So this is a broker just like Zerodha, Kite is a broker. Similarly, interactive broker is also a broker. The difference is it's a global broker. So on this broker, you can not only trade Indian market, you can also trade Singapore market, uh, Dubai market, uh, Europe market, any market, but you should have access to it. Okay. If you are a European citizen, if you are situated in US, then you have to open an account in US, you will be able to trade that US market. But one interesting thing about interactive broker is they have this feature of paper trading. Okay. Paper trading means virtual money. So by using virtual money, you can actually learn about different markets, you know, whether it be bond, whether it be crypto, they also have crypto also, Forex also, any market that you want, all the market, you can just get the data, backtest it, run it. Okay. Everything you can do by using this broker. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else has any other doubt? So... Uh, I, I will not be able to trade in other market if I'm an Indian citizen, right? Yes, correct. Okay. For some backtesting result, do you have the results in numbers? I mean, uh, the, how many trade are in profit or how many trade in loss? Yes. What is the profit and loss? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Everything we will be discussing. Like, I'll just show you. Uh, if you go to the dashboard, like I have provided you with some strategies like this MACD strategy. Now, okay. if you look at MACD strategy, I have provided you the result, like starting back testing, starting period is this ending period is this, then return was 9%. Buy and hold would have given you minus 12%. Volatility is 20%. Calma ratio is 0.113%. So everything is available. Now, if you want to get list of all the trade, you know, on which day, what trade was taken, how much profit was there on that trade, that is also provided by you, uh, you know, provided by the uh, library that we will be using. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one last question. How do we like store these files? Like, is it always we code online or do we like, do you show a format how we store? Yeah. So folder, folder uh, I mean by folder format, everything. Correct. Correct. So there is this software called as VS code. Okay. This software okay. I will be explaining you. Uh, after a few sessions, not today, after uh, two or three weeks, I will be explaining how to install this software. This is uh, something called as ID. Okay. What is ID? I'll explain later, but this software you'll use to code all of your strategies. So this is how the okay. code looks like 
like uh, one of the strategy I was back testing. This is this was all the trades that were taken by that strategy. Okay, mm -hmm. so different things uh, you can do by using this uh, ID that is a VS Code. Okay. All right. So, uh, anyone else want to ask anything, or should we move ahead okay. with the session? I use a, a, a system called a, a trading technology TT. Is that something from interactive brokers is easier to easy to migrate to that? Uh, I'm not sure. You're based in UK, right? Yeah. Yeah, I do have some UK student, and they have the working interactive broker account. So I think yeah. it should be easy for you to migrate to interactive broker. Yeah, but I also use TT for commodities, right? Um, so I was wondering uh, if I change from, I want to use both, right? Interactive workers and um, TT. Mm -hmm. So I guess I just use TT to kind of like how to connect to it. So see, once you learn one broker, okay, once you learn about how to build strategy on interactive broker, you will have a very decent knowledge on how to do the same on the other broker. Okay, so that shouldn't be a problem for you once you learn on one broker. Okay. Only when it is paper trading, right? If, if I'm using some other broker. Mm -hmm. okay, can you please repeat? Yeah, if I am using Jiroda, so I mean, opening account in this interactive broker, so for what benefit is for me? That yeah. I can try so paper trading, right? Correct. I'll tell you what are the other benefits. So I'll, I, as I told you, I will be explaining two broker. One is interactive broker, which will be the major uh, main broker. There is another broker called as Fires broker. Now this Fires broker is for Indian student. Okay. Anyone who is situated in India. So they, for them, I have, I will be having a separate session on Fires. So once you learn this broker, you will be able to do the same on Zeroda, uh, Kite Connect or, uh, you know, Angel One. There are multiple brokers. Yeah. Anyone, any broker you have, if you uh, attain this session, you will be able to implement the same on just, the other Indian broker. I just shifted my account to Amazon Stock. There is a new one. Uh, I I couldn't hear you. Can you please repeat? I just shifted my account to M Stock. Acha. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Any broker you have, you will be able to do it. Now there are a few more benefits of interactive broker, uh, like option chain data. Like if you're someone who is trading in option, uh, you should be knowing that there is this concept of option chain, which is very important for trading. Now, if you want this option chain data in Python, you have to pay some external service provider, you know, data provider separately. Whereas all the data is available for free in interactive broker. Okay, you just make an account, fund your account with 10,000 rupee, and you will be able to get your option chain, option live data for free. You don't have to pay anything extra. So these are a few reasons why I suggest everyone to move to interactive broker. Otherwise, you know, if you are uh, used to some other broker, you can use that broker too. Yes, it's that. So uh, uh, this, if you're telling about this interactive broker, so they are providing the historical data on option chains also. Expired contract or yes. the running contract? Expired contracts. No, none like. I don't know any broker. There is one broker called as ICICI Direct in India, which provide uh, data for expired contract. Okay. Okay. And the, this uh, interactive broker, we can also find Indian scripts on the interactive broker, yes. and in the, including indexes also. Yes. Yes. And we can trade in for real also. I mean, not just paper. Yes. Paper. You can trade in real also. And all the data is provided by interactive broker that is for free. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll just show you how this looks like. Like, let's say you are trading on Bank Nifty. So right now the market is closed. So if you want to look at option chain, you can just search for option chain. It will give you the option chain data. Okay. So let's say you're trading in US market. So I have Meta stock here. So I'll just search for option chain for Meta stock. You cannot trade it, you know, uh, live, but you can do the paper trading part. That is quite helpful uh, when it comes to learning. Okay. Not only US market, you can also trade uh, this crypto market. Like here I have BTC. So this is the current market data of BTC. Uh, I have Ethereum. Uh, I can also trade currency pair. Okay. Like uh, here I have USD JPY. 
Okay, USD JPY data is also free. Whether you want a one year data, two year data, you can easily get it just by writing a single line of code. All right, so I guess that's it for the introduction part. Now let's move to the actual programming part. Okay, so today will be our first session in which we will be learning about two topics. One is numbers and variable. And if we have time, we will also be covering a little bit of strings. So at any point, if you have any doubt, you want to ask anything, just raise your hand. I would request all of you to mute yourself. Okay, any doubt you have while I'm explaining, you can just raise your hand and you can ask me your doubt. Okay, so everyone, please mute yourself. Okay. All right, so why Python? Now in market, there are other programming languages too. Like there is C++, there is Java, there is JavaScript, there is Kotlin, multiple languages are there. So why should we learn Python? So there are three reasons why you should learn Python. One is it is easy to read. Second is it is fast. And third is it is versatile. Now, if you compare Python with other language, it is way easier to read. Now, when I say fast, I don't mean to say that programmatically it is fast. What I mean to say is if there are two developers, one is writing code in Python, the other is writing code in C++, the Python developer will take less time to write the code. Why? Because it is easy to write. The third is versatile. Now, what do I mean by versatile? It means it can be used in multiple industry. It is not only used in tech industry. It is also used in medical industry. It is also used in aviation industry and particularly in finance industry. Also, it's quite popular. So if I talk about finance industry, it is used in stock market. It is used for analysis. It is used in actuary. So for those of you who don't know actuary, they are people who design complex mathematical model uh, for loans and all. Okay, you can just research about it, you'll come to know. So over there also Python is uh, widely used. So these are a few reasons why we should learn Python, not other programming languages. Now, the first thing you should know in Python is Python interpreter. Now, what's an interpreter? Now, let's say that, uh, you know, I want to communicate with one of the student and that student don't know English. Okay, let's say he know Tamil. So how will I communicate with him? So I need some third student who knows Tamil and Hindi, Tamil and English both. So I will explain the concept to him and he will explain the Tamil. Uh, he will explain the concept in Tamil to that third person. Okay. This is how we are going to communicate. That third person is the interpreter. He is understanding my language and he's explaining uh, the concept to the uh, other person. Right. Now the same thing is applicable for computers also. Now in reality, computers don't understand Hindi and English. Okay. They only understand zeros and one, which is called binary language. So if there are two computers and if they are talking with each other, they'll just talk like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1 in that way they're going to talk. Okay. So if you wish to communicate with the computer, you need a software and that software name is the Python interpreter. What this interpreter will do, it will try to understand our language and it will convert that language to zeros and one. So in any computer, if you wish to run a Python code without this software, you cannot run it. Okay. If you want to run Python code, we need a Python interpreter. If you want to run C++ code, so for C++, they have a different software called as C++ uh, compiler. For JavaScript, we have JavaScript compiler. So for Python, we have Python interpreter. Okay. So what's a Python interpreter? If I ask you uh, in our next session, you will tell me that Python interpreter is a software that converts a high level language. High level language means Python to a low level language. Low level language means zeros and one that is binary language. Okay. That this, uh, 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 this language conversion is done by Python interpreter. So once you install it, this is how the interpreter looks like. We are not going to install it today. We will install it after a few sessions. We will be using the online interpreter. Now, what's an online interpreter? I told you that there is a software called as VS Code, right? So those software I will be discussing later. So today we will be using some website. So on that website, someone has already installed the Python interpreter for us. So we don't have to do the installation part. You can directly go to the website and you can start writing the code. So I'll just show you one of the interpreter. You can just go to Google and just search for Python interpreter. Okay, so you'll see multiple websites. You will use this online GDB uh, website. Okay, you just have to go, go to this website. You just make sure that Python 3 is selected here and you just click on run button. So on this website, they have installed the Python interpreter and this is where we have to write the Python code. Uh, and once you click on this green run button, the output will be visible on the output screen. Okay. So this is, this was about Python interpreter. Now let's discuss about mathematical operator. 
Now, if you have ever studied maths, you know that in maths, in maths we have mathematical operators like plus, minus, subtraction, all those things. So similar thing we also have in Python. So operators like addition, we have multiplication. Now for multiplication, we use star. Okay, we don't use anything else. We use star. If you want to do exponent, like you want to do 2 raised to 3, 5 raised to 5, those things. So you write double star. So if I write 2 double star 3, it means I'm saying 2 raised to 3. Okay, you can also say 2 power 3. Then subtraction, we do minus. If you want to do division. Now division is quite interesting because when you divide two numbers, there are two important results that we get. One is the quotient and one is the reminder. Whenever you wish to get the quotient, you write slash. Okay, you do 30 slash 6, it will give you the quotient. But in case if you want the reminder, in that case, you'll use the modulus operator. Now, what's a modulus operator? This is how the modulus operator look like, percentage. So if I do 10 modulus 3, it will give me 1. 1 is what? 1 is the reminder. It is not the quotient. Okay, if you wish to get the quotient, you have to do slash. 30 slash 6, it will give you 5. So these are a few mathematical operators that exist in Python. Now let's understand about types of value. Now, if I ask anyone about their age, he will tell me a number. If I ask him his name, he will tell me uh, a character, okay, a name with a character in it. Except for Elon Musk, he has named this child some weird thing. But majority of the people are going to tell me, uh, you know, English character words. So similarly, Python also needs to categorize different types of values. So today we will be learning two types of value. The first is integer and the second is float. Now, what is integer? Any real number, any number that you see, is considered as an integer number. If that number has a point in it, if that number has a decimal in it, so we say it's a float number. Okay, we don't say uh, numbers, we say int. Uh, we don't say decimal, we say float value. Okay, so we categorize different values into different categories and we call it data type. So integer is a data type, float is one data type. Okay, as we go ahead with, the, uh, uh, with our future session, I will be discussing about other data types. So today we have discussed two data types. So remember this one is integer and other is float. Now let's talk about order of operation. Now let's say you have written one equation like this. And on the other side, you have written a similar equation like this. Now if you execute the Python code, and if you look at the output, you'll see that you're going to get different answer for different equation. Now if you notice that both the equations are exactly same, the only difference is bracket. Here we have bracket and here we don't have a bracket. But still the results are different. This is because of a rule called as PEMDAS rule. So if you remember in maths, we have a BODMAS rule. Similar rule we have in Python, which is called PEMDAS rule. Okay, where PEMDAS stands for parenthesis, exponent, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. Now parenthesis means bracket. So parenthesis is the technical term that we use. Instead of calling it a bracket, we say it's a parenthesis. Okay, so they are both same. There are nothing uh, difference is there. So whenever you see an equation, if you want to know what will be the answer, you have to follow this rule and you'll understand what the output is, why you're getting this output. So why we are getting this 36 here? Because 5 plus 7 is being executed first. So I'm getting 12 and then 12 into 3 is being executed. So I'm getting 36. Whereas on the right side, first multiplication is executed. Why? Because multiplication have greater precedence compared to addition. So that's why multiplication will be executed first. And then I'm going to get 26 as the final answer. Okay, so this is how the Python interpreter interprets the equation. Now, let's make a small project. Okay, let's say that you want to buy a stock. Okay, let's say the stock is Apple and the, the value of the Apple stock, the price of the Apple stock is $1450. Okay, $1450 is the price of the stock. But the problem is you only have $60 in your portfolio. Okay, you only have $60 and you're allowed to spend one by third of your portfolio. So if you have $60, you're only allowed to spend $20. But you still want to buy this stock because you got some insider news that this stock is going to go up. So you have a lot of your friend, all of your friend have a similar portfolio size. Everyone is having $60 in their portfolio. Now the question is, how many portfolios would we need if we want to buy this stock? I'll repeat the question one more time. Each portfolio has a amount of $60 in it. All of the portfolio managers are allowed to spend one by third of its portfolio. That is each one can spend $20. The price of the stock is $1450. So we want to calculate how many portfolios we need to buy this stock. This is the question. So if I just try to write the code, this is what I'm going to write. I'm going to write 1450 divided by 60 divided by three. Now, if you look at the answer, the answer that 
will be shown in the output screen will be 8.06. Now I want someone among you to tell me what is wrong in this answer. Just look at the answer and tell me what is wrong in this. Can anyone tell me what is wrong? We haven't included parenthesis for 60 divided by 3. Yes. And anything else? Okay. Now, if you look at the answer, if you look at 8.06, there are two things that you can understand. The first is the value is too low. Imagine if you call eight of your friend, all of them investing $20, do you think you will be able to buy the stock? The answer is no. This is one problem. The other is the decimal problem. How will I call 8.06 of my friend? Either I can call eight friend or I can call nine friend. I cannot call 8.06 friend. So there are two problems in this answer. So we will solve both of them. So first let's solve the wrong answer problem. That is the value is too low. The reason why we are getting this value is because my Python interpreter is solving it in a wrong way. Okay. I wanted Python interpreter to solve 60 by three first, but in reality interpreter is solving 1450 divided by 60 first. So I'm getting 24.17 and then 24.17 is divided by three. Okay. That's the reason why I'm getting 8.06 as the answer. So if I don't want that to happen. So what I can do, I can add a bracket. If I add a bracket around 60 by three, first 60 by three will be executed. So I'll get 20 and then 1450 will be divided by 20 and I'll get 72.5. Okay. Still the second problem remains. The first problem I have solved. If I call 72 or 73 of my friend, if all of them invest $20, I think I will be able to buy the stock worth $1450. Okay. But how to solve the decimal problem? So in few minutes, I'll tell you how to solve the decimal problem. But before moving to that, let's understand about a new concept of variable. Now, what's a variable? Now, I'm pretty sure all of you already know what's a variable. You should have learned it in a mathematical topic in your school days. So I'll still explain you. Variable is like a container. Okay, let's say you have a value 60. Now, if you want, you can save that 60 value in a container. And that container is called variable. And you can name your variable, whatever you want. So in this case, I have named the variable portfolio underscore limit. So this is variable name and this is variable value. So 60 by three is being saved in the variable portfolio limit. This is what is happening in front of you. Okay. So what I can do, I can use this variable name instead of using this value, because I know that in this variable, I have the 60 by three. So wherever I wish to use 60 by three, I'll just write portfolio limit. Now, what's the benefit of doing this? Why not to directly write 60 by three, but instead of that, making a variable, the benefit is readability of the code increases. Okay. First, if I write 60 by three, if the third person comes and reads the code, he'll not understand what you have written. 60 by three can be anything, right? But if he writes portfolio limit, if you look at the variable and if he reads the variable name, he'll understand, okay, this is what this variable represents. So this is what the value might be. He'll get a little bit of idea of what we are trying to do here. So whenever you're naming a variable, make sure that your variable is descriptive. Okay. If someone else reads your variable name, he should also understand what type of value you're trying to store in that variable. Okay. So these are a few things that you should keep in mind. And these are the reasons why we should use variable. Clear everyone. Now, if I use a variable and if I write the code, this is how my code will look like. Previously, I wrote a code, but that code only contained numbers. Okay. They were not that descriptive. If someone else reads that code, he'll not understand what I'm trying to do. But now when you look at this code, if even a third person, if even a third programmer looks at your code, even he will understand what you're trying to do. Okay. You are having a variable portfolio limit. You're having portfolio per stock. So for per stock, how many portfolios we need? These are all the things you can understand by looking at this code. That's why you should always try to make a variable wherever it's possible. Okay. So this is our first code. So let's try to write this code on an interpreter. So what I want everyone to do, I'll just send this link in the chat room. Just click on this link and visit this website right now. Okay. We will write our first code and see how it is, how to execute it. Okay. Just click on the link. Once you click on the link, you will come to this website. Just make sure that you have selected Python three. Okay. Don't select any other website, any other, uh, drop down. Just make sure that Python three is selected and just click on this run button. Once you click on run button, this is how the output should look like. Okay. So everyone quickly go to this site and just give me a thumbs up that you have reached the site. So 
Firstly, is there a link to this website? Yes, Anil. Is there a link to this website? Yeah, I have sent the link in the chat room. Um, you mean the um WhatsApp chat room? No, no, the Zoom chat room. Uh, yeah. yeah, or you can just go to Google and search for Python interpreter. I'll show you. Just search for Python interpreter, and you'll see this website on third or fourth link. Just click on online GDB. All right, so I'm going to write the code now. I want everyone to write the code with me. Now, before writing the code, there are a few things you should remember. Okay, let me just show you on the PPT. Now, whenever you're naming a variable, these are the rules you should remember. What rules? The first rule is your variable should not have a space in it. Okay, so I'll show you on the interpreter. If I have A is equal to 100, if I run the code, it's fine. Okay. Now I'll write ABC equal to 200. Even this is fine. But if I have A, B space C, and if I run the code, this is not fine. Why? Because you cannot have a space in your variable name. Okay. So always remember that you cannot have a space in your variable name. This is the first rule. What's the second rule? The second rule is you cannot start your variable with a number or a special character. Special character, what a special character? On the top of your keyboard, you can see that exclamation, add, hash, dollar, percentage, all those things. They are all special character. So you cannot use that to start your variable name. So here, I cannot make a variable like this. You cannot start it with a star. This is not allowed. If I run the code, you'll see it's going to throw an error. Okay. And I cannot start it with a number also. If I cannot write six ABC, even this will throw an error. So these are the few rules you should remember. Other than this, whatever you want, you can name your variable. Okay. Then how will you name your variable? If you don't have a space, if you cannot use a space, how will you name your variable? So there are two ways to do solve this problem. The first is you'll write underscore. Okay. If I have two words, swallow limit, I'll write swallow underscore limit. This will solve our space problem. So this way of naming your variable is called python case or oh, sorry snake case okay whenever you write underscore it's called snake case the other way to solve this problem is you write your first word and you write the second word first character capital so i'll write swallow limit l capital now when someone reads this word he'll understand that there are two words one is swallow and one is limit by looking at this capital l so this way of making your variable is called camel case so if you go and uh, read any JavaScript developer code, so in JavaScript world, they usually use camel case. In Python world, we use snake case. Anything you can use, but as a Python developer, you should prefer using snake case. Okay. So like, let's say if I want to add a space here. So instead of adding a space, I'll write underscore. If I run the code, it's fine. It's not going to throw any error. Okay, so three rules you should remember. Your variable should not start with a number. It should not start with a special character. It should not have a space in it. How to solve the space problem? Two ways. Either you can use snake case or you can use camel case. Okay, so as a Python developer, you should always use snake case. So now let's write the code. So I'll write stock underscore price. What was the stock price? Stock price was 1450. Right. Then portfolio underscore limit is how much? It is 60 by 3. Correct. Then we made another variable portfolio per stock. Portfolio per stock is equal to how much? It is stock price divided by portfolio limit. So this portfolio limit is how much a single portfolio can afford and portfolio per stock is how many portfolios we need. See, when I read the variable name, I come to know what type of value we are storing. 
right now if you if i run the code nothing will be shown in the output screen why because whenever you want to show something on the output screen you have to use the print function okay you'll write print and within the round bracket you'll write whatever you want to print like let's say i want to print stock prices so i'll write stock underscore prices so if i run the code you'll see that 1450 is printed so let's say i want to print portfolio limit so i'll copy portfolio limit and i'll paste it within the print if i run the code portfolio limit is printed if i want to print portfolio per stock i'll copy this variable and i'll paste it within the print if i run the code now you'll see portfolio uh, per stock is printed that is 72.5 so this is mathematically right but logically i cannot have a decimal point as the answer so this problem we will solve in few minutes now before moving to the next problem i want all of you to note this down okay just go to this site just write this code click on the run button and see if you are able if you are getting this output or not if anyone faces any issue you can let me know you can share your screen okay Just give me a thumbs up if you are done writing the code. Hi Sunil, for today I just logged in from my mobile. So from next week onwards, I'll make my laptop arranged for this. Okay. Yeah. So laptop is mandatory. Yes. Okay, yes. Without... yes. From um, next next session onwards, I'll join through laptop. Today, yeah, sure. some issues with the laptop. Thanks. No problem. Yes, Rajendra, you can share your screen. So everyone look at the error that Rajendra is facing. It is saying syntax error near unexpected token bracket. Uh, just run, run your code one more time, Rajendra. Click on run button. Yes. So look at the variable name. So can anyone tell me what, what the mistake is? Yeah, in the print, it was like portfolio per stock underscore price extra it is there. So it yes. should be portfolio per stock. Correct. So Rajendra, you have added one extra you know, string at the end. That was not needed. Yes. Now run the code. Just select your variable portfolio per stock. Just do double click on it. I think that variable and the print is different. Just copy that variable name and paste it again.
just click on that variable again, portfolio per stock. Yeah, round bracket, portfolio per stock. Now run the code. Just refresh your page. Re refresh your page and run it again. Just do one thing, just paste your code in the chat room. Just copy your code and paste it in the chat room. And stop your share. Uh, Rajendra, maybe you can try again. You know, you can stop your share. Just try again and let me know once you are done. So I'll just send the code in the chat room too. Okay, for those of you who are facing some issue, you can just cross check it if there is any issue on your side. All right, so let's move to the next project. Okay, now previously it was just a portfolio of an individual. Now a bank want to buy a stock. Now instead of making, instead of writing just a number, now I'm going to make separate variable for separate value. So I've made a variable percentage what is equal to one by three. I've made a variable stock price equal to one four five zero. I've made a variable bank money equal to nine hundred. Then I've made a variable bank limit equal to bank money into percentage. Now, what's the difference in this code and the previous code? In the previous code, I just had the numbers. Uh, yeah, Porus, you want to ask something? Uh, we haven't solved for that, you know, 0.5, the decimal yes. one. Yes, correct. So we will be solving it in at the end okay. of the slide. Okay. So uh, what I was saying is in this situation, I'm making separate variable for separate values. What's the benefit of this? The benefit is now my code is more descriptive. Okay. Each value has a variable name. So each value is understandable that what value that represent. Okay. These are the benefits of making a variable. So on this line, I've written bank limit equal to bank money into percentage. Why into percentage? Because bank money will be 900 into percentage is one by three because bank also has a limit that it can spend one by third of its portfolio. So I have done 900 divided by three, same thing I've done, but by using two different variables. Okay. In the previous code, I've just written, uh, 60 by three, but here I'm writing bank money into percentage bank money is 900 into percentage is one by three. Okay. It will give me what it will give me a bank limit as 300. So what is 300? 300 is the amount that a single bank can invest. Okay. We have a similar problem here. Bank also want to buy the stock, same stock. Bank also have a limit of 300. Okay. So we want to know how many banks we need to buy that stock. Okay. Same problem, but in this case, bank want to buy the stock. So now I have to calculate number of bank. So what I've done, I've made a variable num underscore bank. Now notice the variables name. It is not necessary that you have to name it completely. Okay. I've just written P E R C. If I can understand if someone else can understand just by looking at it, it's fine. You can name your variable, whatever you want. It's not mandatory that you have to name it completely. Okay. So here also I've written num underscore bank, which means number of bank, which is equal to stock price divided by bank limit. What is stock price? Stock price is 1450. What is bank limit? Bank limit was 300. So if you divide 1450 with 300, you are going to get 4.8. Now, mathematically, this is the right answer, but we still have the same problem that should I should four bank invest or should five bank invest? Okay. This is still the problem because the value is decimal point. It's not a real number. Now, if you think about it logically, if, if four bank invest tries, tries to buy the stock, then they won't be able to buy the stock. 
so logically we should approximate 4.8 to the greater value okay not a lower value lower value will not solve the problem so a lot of time in future also you have to make a decision okay in approximation do i have to approximate to the lower side or the upper side it totally depends on the situation okay so we i analyzed uh, by looking at the by understanding the situation that i should approximate this 4.8 4.8 to a greater value now the question is how to do it so now there are multiple ways to solve this problem i'm going to show one of the pro one of the solution what we will do we will use the int function so previously we used one function that is print function what print function does whatever you write within the print function will be shown in the output screen that's the feature of a print function okay similar to print function we have another function that is int function what int does whenever you write any decimal number within the int it will approximate that int uh, it, it will approximate that float to a integer value so if i write 4.8 it will approximate it to 4 Remember that it will always approximate to a lower value, not higher value. If you write 9.9, .9, it will approximate it to 9. If you write 11.1, .1, it will still approximate it to 11. So no matter what decimal number you have, it will always approximate to a lower value. But as per the situation, I need the greater value. So what I did, I just added plus 1 at the end. So this will give me 4 and this plus 1 will finally give me 5. Now, if I put everything together, this is how my final code will look like. So I have percentage, I have stock price, bank money, bank limit, number of bank. And at the end, I'm approximating the number of bank and I'm adding one to it. So I'm getting five as the final answer. Okay. So I'll give you guys uh, three to four minutes. I want everyone to write this code down. Okay. And also remember that this is one way of approximating the value. There are other ways too, which we will be discussing in our future slides. Okay. I've shown you the first way. And in this way, I have used the int function. So till now we have seen two functions. One is int function, one is print function. Okay. Now what are functions? I'm pretty sure you already know, all of you. We have used the function. You might have used it in Excel. In Excel also, we have the same topic of function. But we will be having a dedicated session after three to four weeks in which I'll teach you in much more detail about functions. Okay. How to make a functions, uh, how to use the function, everything we will be discussing in much more detail. Right now, we are just utilizing it. Okay. So these are inbuilt functions. Okay. These functions are provided by the Python interpreter. We don't have to make our own function for now, but in future, we have to make our own function. All right. So just note it down and let me know once you are done. Okay, so Sagar asked me a question that if the number of bank is a perfect integer, then we don't need to add plus one. Yes, Sagar, if it's a perfect integer, you don't have to write one. Now you might be wondering, how do we code this, right? That if this happens, do this, if this happens, do that. So for that, we have to learn conditional, which we will be learning after a few sessions. So once we cover that topic, then we can actually code this situation. Yeah, Rabindra, you're asking something. Uh, yes. So if the stock price is fourteen fifty and my bank limit is like three hundred, right? Correct. So how can uh, I buy five stock? Not five stock. See, a single yes. bank can spend three hundred dollars. So. Okay. We want to know how many banks we need to buy that stock and the price okay. of the stock is 1450. Okay, so five bank will like uh, club and buy one stock, Correct. right? Correct. Kind of. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Got it. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, Puras. Uh, you know, uh, when I run int under int into bracket num underscore bank plus one, and mm -hmm. I run it, I don't see an output. Do we need to type yes. print for that as well? Correct. So I'll just show you. So if I just write a variable, okay, like if I write uh, anything, like I'll write int 2.2 .2 plus 1. Now this thing, 
is not stored anywhere. So if I run the code, I'll not see the output. Okay, so if you want to see it in the output screen, you have to add it in the bracket first. And then in the start, you have to write print. print. Okay. Okay, so we have a function within a function. Within sure, the print it. function, we have an int function. So even this is allowed. Okay, thanks. Put it on back screen. Yes, Rabindra. That one by three wala. Ha. So yes. I have not written the code yes. yet. Yeah, I'll okay. just show you. This is how the code looks like. Okay. So if you want to see the value of any variable, you have to print it. Okay. In print, you have to write that variable name. So you'll come to know what value is being stored in that variable name. The last line is uh, num bank equal to, it is the same one, right? Last this line. Like, last line is a part of this line, right? The stock uh, num oblique bank. Or it is a new one. It's a new line. This last line is a new line. So there will be total three, four, five, six line. But this sixth line needs to be added in a print function. I'll, I'll just show you. Yeah. So see, I'll just write the code. I'll write percentage is equal to one by three. Yes. Stock price. Press stock underscore price equal to one four five zero. Yeah. Then I'll write num underscore bank. So before num underscore bank, I have to calculate num a uh, bank limit. So bank underscore limit is equal to bank money i need bank money also so let's make another variable bank money bank underscore bank. money is equal to 900, 900. then bank limit yes, bank. is bank money bank money public into percentage yes yes the number of bank is how much bank uh, stock price stock price divide by divide by bank uh, bank limit bank limit yes okay now i'll check if my number of bank is correct or not so if i just print this much and if i run the code the value is 4.8333 now i need to approximate the value okay now there are two things i can do either i can directly print it or i can store it in a variable okay so i'll just make a new variable like new underscore num underscore bank equal to, uh, I'll write int number of bank plus one. Yeah, and I'll one. just print new number of bank. So if I run the code, I'll get five as the answer. Or what else I could have done, I'll just copy this variable name. Instead of making a new variable, I'll just save the value in the same variable. Okay. So this and also you one. can do. If I run the code again, I'm going to get five. So on line seven might be a little confusing on line seven. We are first approximating the variable number of bank. We are adding one to it 
and then whatever final value we are getting, we are storing it again into the number of bytes. Okay, so always on the right side, whatever we have will be executed first and will be assigned to the variable on the left side. Okay, keep that in mind. So for those of you who, are, who have not completed yet, you can just note this down. Yes, Boris. Uh, so, Sonal, if we have two variables with the same name, right? You have two variables now, num underscore bank in row number five, and yes. you have num underscore bank in row number seven. Yes. Uh, it is not an issue. It will uh, it will not be a problem if we have two variables with different uh, conditions mentioned or numbers mentioned. So, so we so, get two results here, right? For that. See, we only have a single variable here. Okay. On line five, I made a variable number of bank in that I saved the value. On line six, I printed the value of that number bank. Okay. And on yeah. line seven, I updated the value of the variable name. So before line seven, if you try to access the value of num number of bank, it will be four pointed. But after seven, if you try to access the number of bank, it will be five. So okay. the variable is same. The value got updated. So the, the order of preference will be, you know, uh, the order of execution will be number five will get executed first. Correct. And then number seven will get updated. Yes. So in Python, oh. the code is executed line by line. Line. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So I hope this is done. Anyone facing any issue? Anyone want to share your screen? All right. So this is it for our first topic. That is variables. Okay. Now let's solve few problems, you know, to get used to this topic. So what I want you guys to do is, uh, you have, so notice that whenever you divide to number, you'll always get a float value. So let me show you if I write print, if I write 10 divided by three, okay. And if I run the code, you'll see always I'll get a decimal point. Even if I do 10 divided by two, okay. The answer should be five, but notice that it will be 5.0. So whenever you do division in Python, it will always give you a decimal number. Okay. That is a float number. Now the pro question is you have to write a code to approximate the value to two digit. Okay. Now let's say if I divide 10 by three, so I'm getting what value I'm getting 3.33333. So what I want you to do, I want you to think of a way to come up with a code, which will always give me the value till two digit after point. So right now it is three point a multiple three, right? It should only give me 3.33. Now, how to do it? I leave it to you guys. Okay. You can use Google. You can do whatever you want, but no matter what division you do, like you have to make a variable answer is equal to, you can do any two number division. Like let's say I do a uh, hundred divided by nine. Okay. Now if I print this answer, you'll see I'm going to get 11.111. So what I want, it should not print 11.111. It should print only 11.11. .11. Okay. 11.2L is also fine. 11.11 .11 or 11.2L, but it should not exceed more than two digit after decimal. Okay. So I'll give you guys five to 10 minutes to solve this problem. You can use Google also. Don't uh, write your code in the chat room. Just give me a thumbs up that you're done writing the code. Okay. So just think about it logically, how you will do it. So I'll tell you a practical situation for this. 
Okay, a very very practical situation which happens a lot of time. Now let's say you have placed a uh, order at hundred. Okay, you have bought a stock at hundred and you want to have a stop loss for this stock. Now when you are having a stop loss, let's say you are having five percent stop loss, so you want to have stop loss at ninety five. Now a lot of time what happened? People calculate the stop loss by using some calculation. You know they use ATR or something to calculate the stop loss. Now a lot of time this value might come out to be a decimal point, and when you say a broker that you know place a stop order at ninety five point five 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 five, broker will throw an error. It will say I don't know ninety five point five 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 five, because a lot of broker only support few decimal point. Like if it's a forex market, they only support four pips. You cannot exceed more than four pips, right? For any broker, they have some limit. Like if they have a limit of uh five four digit, you cannot send ten digit after a decimal point. They will throw an error. So this is the situation that we are trying to solve. We are trying to limit the number of uh the numbers that we can have after the decimal point. Right now, the limit that I have given you is two decimals. Okay. So I hope the problem is clear. So everyone, just give it a try. Let me know once you are done. If you want, I can explain the problem again for those of you who have not understood. Can can I save these codes? Yeah, I'll I'll show you how to save the code in okay. five minutes. Okay. Okay, so I'll give you one more challenge for those of you who are using some function. Okay, so try to do it without using a function. So you are allowed to use int function. Okay, if you can solve this problem with int function, that would be great. Like you can solve this by using other functions too, but I want, you know, you guys to solve it using an int function. Take it as a challenge and try to think of a way to solve this problem. Don't use a round function. Of course, you know if you use a round function, it will be done instantly. But I want you to think of a way to solve this problem by using int function. So Manik and Anil is done. So Manik, Anil, have you guys used a round function or some other approach you have used? 
I used a function, so I'm trying to do using integer now. Okay. All right, so for those of you who want to save the code, there is this website called as Replit. Replit.com. Okay, so I want everyone to make an account on this website. So what is this website? This website is online interpreter, but with a option to save the file also. Okay, so this website and this online GDP, they are same. But the problem on online GDP is you cannot save the file. Okay, once you have written the code, once you refresh the code, it's done, it's gone. But on Replit, you can create a file and you can save the file. Okay, so just make an account and just click on create a REPL. So I will just click on Python. Just name your uh, file as, you know, variable 24 September, something like this. And just click on create REPL. This is how the REPL will look like. So here you can just paste the code. Just copy your code, paste it, that's it. So you can run it too. If you just click on run button, it will show you the output. Now again, when you will go to your dashboard, okay, if I go to the dashboard, like if I go to replit.com again, so I can see the file here. See, this is my variable 24 September. So you don't have to click on save and all it is saved automatically. Once you update the code, it is automatically saved. All right. So this website you guys can use to save the code that we will be writing for our future session. Okay. Sagar, can you show me the solution? Sagar or Anil? Uh, Sagar Sakpal. Sagar, Anil, or Manik, anyone can just explain me the solution. Okay, so Anil uh, has... actually, what I did was uh, I used the function firstly, like round and format functions there, right? So, okay, I so used you have used that. round and format. Uh, otherwise, also, we can do it, we can multiply that by 100. Yes. I'll have to code it. I'm not sure. Uh, 
Right. Yes, you can do that. You can do that. But yeah, it is more memory consuming as well, actually. Mm. But yeah, we'll be only using int function. Uh, Anyone was able to I'm do it? I'm trying to code it, but I'm getting it. No problem, Manik. Anyone was able to do it with int function? Matt, what about you? No, I wasn't um, able to get it with the int function. Um, Which function did you use? Round function? Um, I had number underscore um, number underscore decimal equals str and then um, bracket number. I mean, quite. I had to Google this. Understood. You can just paste your code in the chat room, otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Um, two seconds. Okay, so I'll just show you guys how this can be done. So yeah. what I was expecting is this. Okay, so let's say you, if I run this code right now, it is giving me 11.1111. .11 so first of all, I'll multiply this with 100. Okay, if I multiply it with 100, the decimal will move to two decimal point ahead. So if I run the code, it will be 111, four times one point decimal. Now I'll approximate it. I'll just write int. Okay. So if I run the code, what I'll get? I'll get 1111. Now I'll just divide it with 100. So if I run the code, now it is 11.11. .11. Now no matter what number you give, okay, even if I write 11.22, 100 divided by 22, it'll still approximate it to two digit. Right? It was the logical answer. Okay, this is what I was expecting uh, from you guys, but no problem. Okay, so doing it for the first time requires a bit of logic. So even if you're not able to do it, it's totally fine. Just remember that this approach in future, if you come across such type of situation, you can use this approach. Of course, this can be done uh, very easily by using a format function or a string function or a round function. Even those things can be done. Clear everyone? Anyone has any doubt in this? Anything you have not understood, you want to ask anything? Uh, Ravindra, you are, you are saying something? Oh, no, done. Okay. Thanks. All right. So I guess that's it for today, everyone. Okay. So in our next session, we will be starting with strengths. So on your dashboard, uh, you should have access to both the courses. So you can just go through the video before coming to the session. Okay. The string video you can just watch. And our next session will be on Saturday. Okay. It will be every Saturday, Sunday, same time. Uh, the link, Zoom link, I will be sharing uh, precisely at the starting time because this link is not generated before starting the session. Okay. Once the session start only then I can send you the link. So exactly at 1.30 on Saturday, I'll send you the Zoom link. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, man. All right, then. Thanks, Sunil. Bye, everyone. Bye. So the Bye. recording Thanks, will Sunil. be uploaded by the end of the day. Okay. Bye. Yeah. So now, um, yeah, man. Um, would you mind just posting that code into the chat so I can save it? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. So now, where do you see the uh, course that uh, the, you know the course you're. Uh looking through when do I, I go to the arms library you're talking about the professor pro dashboard yeah i go to dashboard and i see um you don't see any course yeah i only see like a two windows right batch 90. Yeah. can you just share your screen how do i share my screen mm -hmm. uh, 
How do I share my screen? You just have to click on that green button, green share screen. Oh, yeah, and see. then click on desktop one, share. Yes, so you will find the videos today's session recording in batch 19 and all the pre-recorded you'll find it in the second course that is Python for Finance and Algebra. Yeah, just, just click on, uh, just go through terms and condition and click on complete and continue. Okay, then all the things will be available for you. Okay. On the top right, just click on complete and continue. Yes, now the other things will be accessible. Okay. Okay. Yeah, great. Thank you. All right. And just a, finally, um, Ripple account, right? You just open a, you just uh, sign up to Ripple and then copy and paste, right? I said. Okay. A Ripplet? On Ripplet, you're talking about? Yeah. 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 So just make an account, uh, make, uh, create a new file, just paste your code. That's it. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll do that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. See you next week. See you. Bye.